Hi everyone, it's Nicole at The Pearl Review. Hope you're well. Today I'm reviewing Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain, which I feel excited and overwhelmed about. We've got a lot of ground to cover, so let's jump in. My review does not contain spoilers. My analysis does. I will warn you once we get there. The Magic Mountain is one of the three major, larger, modernist novels, the others being James Joyce's Ulysses and In Search of Lost Time by Marcel Proust. Mons is the most readable of the three. This novel follows Hans Kastorp, a young German man who goes to a sanatorium in Switzerland to visit his cousin who is ill with tuberculosis. He's on vacation in 1907 and stays for seven years until the outbreak of World War I. During this time, Kastorp finds two mentors. He ponders life with his cousin and falls in love. The sanatorium is like a hermetically sealed jar. Time seems to stand still and he experiences a break in his bourgeois life. The otherworldliness of the setting, the high snowy Swiss Alps, is intentional even though it has a biographical inspiration. To some people, it seems like nothing happens in this novel, and to others, a lot happens, especially intellectually. I find myself sympathizing with both camps. Mann made this novel many things at once. It's a novel about time, like Proust's. The Magic Mountain is a satire, a sort of black comedy about the decadent and morbidly preoccupied Belle Epic era. The patients also represent liberals who unwittingly march into World War I. These characters are also at times stand-ins for the great ideas and movements of Europe at the time. The book is a building's roman and a parody of the genre itself as well, which is to say it's the story of the education of a young man, but it's also a farce because we wonder if Hans truly learns and what the education is preparing him for. Baked into this masterpiece are ideas from prominent philosophers, studies in anatomy, archobiology, and more. The references are baked in too. This gives the novel some of its grandness. You have something very rich here, but I'll return to that later in the analysis. The book hops from subject to subject as Hans grows as a person under the direction of his two mentors, Lodovico Sedembrini and Leo Naphtha. By the way, you're going to either love or hate the arguments that these two have with each other. Though we're given a feast of subjects, there are a few overriding ones, namely death, sexuality, and creativity in that order and also mixed together. It's a beautifully written book. There's only two translations and critics overwhelmingly suggest the one by John E. Woods. I'm going to include an example to give you a better idea of the novel style. A few minutes later, he himself was standing in the stocks while the little thunderstorm raged and Joachim, his body closed from view again, began to dress. Once again, the director peered through the milky pane, but this time into Hans Kastorp's interior, and from his mutterings, ragtag curses and phrases, it appeared his findings corresponded to his expectations. In response to much begging, he was kind enough to allow his patient to view his own hand through the fluoroscope, and Hans Kastorp saw exactly what he should have expected to see, but which no man was ever intended to see, and which he himself had never presumed he would be able to see. He saw his own grave. Under that light, he saw the process of corruption anticipated, saw the flesh in which he moved, decomposed, expunged, dissolved into airy nothingness, and inside was the delicately turned skeleton of his right hand, and around the last joint of the ring finger, dangling black and loose, the signet ring his grandfather had bequeathed him. A hard thing, this awe with which man adorns a body predestined to melt away beneath it, so that it can be free again and move on to yet other flesh that may bear it for a while. Many critics suggest reading the novel twice, which I usually do with my favorite books, and I definitely suggest it here. Nabokov once said, Curiously enough, one cannot read a book. One can only reread it. A good reader, a major reader, an active and creative reader is a rereader. One flaw worth mentioning is the iciness of this novel. Man definitely is a child of the repressed, overmannered Victorian era, and he's known as a philosophical novelist as well. 
But unlike, say, Dostoevsky, he doesn't wed these ideas with soulful, deeply rounded out characters or dramatic, dense plot lines. One Goodreads reviewer put it well that there's just not enough blood or heart in this novel. And I do partially agree. Um, but I still think that Magic Mountain is a masterpiece. And that is just uncontestable. So as I love this book, Worths and All, who do I recommend this to? Well, maybe fans of Seinfeld, the show about nothing and kind of about everything. Uh, People who found Infinite Jest, Moby Dick, Brothers Karamazov, or In Search of Lost Time rewarding. Those who want to dive into German or modernist literature, and namely those looking to tackle the greats, the big bucket list novels. You can't miss out on this one. So that's my review, guys. Um, If you've already read this or if you don't care about spoilers, now on to analysis. You did it. You made it. Welcome to the fucking club. I'm exhausted. Are you? I have a few rants and raves that I need to get out of my system before I begin the analysis in serious. Fucking Naphtha. What the hell is he? Jesus Christos, what is he? Also, hooray for unexpected queer fiction. I had no idea. Barons as Radamanthus, the judge of the dead in the Greek underworld. Oh, so good. And we get Faust references like the German and Greek mythological gumbo is so cool. I love that. That's just so good. Um, This is either one of the best or worst books to read during COVID. You pick. That Joachim returns in the seance wearing the iconic helmet the Germans wear in the First World War, the pickle haub, as Google tells me. And that Hans doesn't know what it is because it hasn't happened yet. His cousin of the past is looking at him sadly (laughs) with what the future brings. And you know it, but he doesn't. I don't know. That really hit me. (sighs) Thank you. So first off, structure. Be still my depressed 14-year-old reader self. Because Susanna Kaysen, author of Girl Interrupted, wrote a fantastic essay on this book and made a shocking point, to me at least, that the novel is structured like a mountain. Essentially, there's a lot of trudging at the beginning and getting lost in the weeds, then the false summit of the Walpurgis night, then the actual peak of snow and the center of the novel, then we plummet down. To spare time, I'm just putting quotes below because this is my second time recording this. The first recording was 35 minutes, and that's why I'm talking quickly, too. Kaysen also believes that Castorp's obsession with anatomy is his way of dealing with his unfulfilled passion and his obsession for Madame Shosha. Seems fair. Also, Shosha means hot cat in French. I have never read a book so obsessed with death, but I think there's four reasons why, which is remarkable. Namely, German romanticism was preoccupied with death, and Mann had said he and his contemporaries were all sons of this movement. Secondly, tuberculosis. Thirdly, that Mann had admitted to a lifelong interest in the subject, and obviously, and most powerfully maybe, the First World War. And I think this is interesting because we know the First World War is going to happen, and somehow it's submerged into the book. It's, it's very... It, its presence is there. We know it is. And that's it. But I think that's very peculiar and successful here. Much of what else I have to discuss comes from Rodney Symington's Reader's Guide to the Magic Mountain. I highly recommend it. I learned so much. 
Uh, so Symington noted three major influences for man in this work, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, and Wagner. From Schopenhauer, we get a big part of Mann's worldview, that life is conflict and struggle, that the will is a force of its own, and we might be unable to stop it. That's one of the reasons that Castorp's love for Klavdia only means suffering for him. Also, that there is a duality between creativity, lust, and destruction on one side, and the intellect and reason on the other. That the former is the darker side of humanity, and the latter is the lighter, and that it's best to embrace both. Schopenhauer was part of the German Romantic movement, which espouses many of these ideas about darkness. Nietzsche, as influence here, reinforces the idea of this duality by writings on Apollo and Dionysus. Apollo, the mythological figure here, used to represent reason, intellect, man at his best. Um, this is manifested in Sedembrini's better qualities, as well as Joachim's. And then Dionysus, who is dark, lusty, driven by irrational forces, and of course, these are embodied in Naphtha and Klavdia Shosha. Some people interpret Naphtha's in suicide as a logical conclusion to this Dionysian streak and how he is totally a figure of irrationality. And uh, someone who is both of these things in a way combined is Menier or Peter Peppercorn. Now, Nietzsche is the one who says to be human is to be ill. And that's a major, major thing in the book. And tied to that, man also declares passion and creativity are illnesses time and again in this novel. Mann himself famously put it, all interest in disease and death is only another expression of interest in life. He believed that one could not fully experience life without acknowledging death, decay, and accepting the darker and irrational aspects of the self. Mann accepted these things in a way that I really find extraordinarily powerful and thought-provoking, especially in our era of self-improvement, social representation via social media, and self-care. This acceptance and uh, refusing to turn away from our uglier qualities. So I know, I know our culture can be quite negative, but I feel like often that's pointing the finger at other people. And I think we live in a time that is very reluctant to embrace that side of our own humanity. Nietzsche also gives man his title. I will link that quote below. Now, thirdly, the German composer Wagner is another representative of Dionysian romantic forces. Mann saw his own preoccupations with music as an irrational force. Irrationality versus rationality is um, part of that duality that is throughout the novel. Wagner might have been Mann's favorite composer, and he also inspired Mann to create this novel in a polysymphonic kind of way, which means that there are many repeating phrases and themes which work almost like repeating melodies in a symphony. My favorite of these is Hans's preoccupation with Spanish roughs and how he says that death must wear a Spanish ruff. Um, visualizing that I just, I think is hilarious. Wagner's Faust is referenced multiple times, most notably the Walpurgis Night, which also appears in Master and Margarita, if you haven't watched my video on that. And coincidentally, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, which I just watched last week. It's really cool if you haven't seen it. German mythology and Greek mythology can be found throughout the novel, which is one of my favorite things about the novel, but there's just too much for me to go through everything. Um, with that being said, I could keep on going. I think you guys all get the sexual metaphors, the cigars, the pens, the horizontal life, the thermometers, so on and so forth. Um, but I will end with the end because I think it's great and devastating and so powerful. Um, but firstly, there's a um, pretty brilliant 
quote about the ending and the significance of the song Hans is singing that I'd like to mention. This, of course, is the message of Castorp's whole building's roman. Life and death are but two aspects of one and the same phenomenon, neither of which can justly claim to exist independently of the other. Love alone, as he realizes in the snow dream, is the transcending element through which humanity may gain peace. This is why he sings Schubert's The Linden Tree, the symbol of longing for love and peace, just as the narrator loses track of him marching toward the flaming front. So, in light of these words, I will read the last paragraph of this wonderful book. Farewell, Hans. Whether you live or stay where you are, your chances are not good. The wicked dance in which you are caught up will last many a little sinful year yet, and we would not wager much that you will come out whole. To be honest, we are not really bothered about leaving the question open. Adventures in the flesh and spirit, which enhanced and heightened your ordinariness, allowed you to survive in the spirit what you probably will not survive in the flesh. There were moments when, as you played king, you saw the intimation of a dream of love rising up out of death and this carnal body. And out of this worldwide festival of death, this ugly, rutting fever that inflames the rainy evening sky all around, Will love someday rise up out of this too? Thank you for listening. Thanks for staying a while. Thanks for putting up with me. Take care, all of you.